So, someone on my Discord server asked for some help with his first multiplayer game. So we all hopped on a call, and I rented, uh, I mean, I reviewed his code. So if you also want to learn how to make your first multiplayer game, this long unedited video will have a lot of useful info. Also, this project uses my template and my 2D library, so if you are curious, I have videos about those and also a full networking tutorial. But now, let's get into the review. Hopefully my computer can handle this. <laughs> Why not? It's a little dated now. Couldn't it handle it before? Oh yeah, yeah, just fine, but with everybody reading the stream, whatever. Build the server real quick, and I'll build the client just to kind of show you what the mm -hmm. goal of this game is. Very nice port that you have there. Thank you. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> so I'm using a, that would be Git. Uh, I'm using client server, like a client server architecture, and my goal is that I can build and distribute the two, like two separate executables, one for the server, one for the client. Um, and you can kind of configure all of these, and the goal is to have it configurable. Right now, I don't really have any gameplay just yet. I'm still just kind of working on fundamentals, but you can see um, I have a handshake. Mm -hmm. It's being sent an ID. This is the ID here. Player ID is now one, player ID is now zero. So every, uh, every client has their own unique ID to it, and they can get when other players connect. And you can see it is networked properly. It's a little rough right now because I just have it kind of only being sent every two or three frames to send network updates. So that's definitely on my list to do. Uh, no, it's okay. It's okay. So you're using, yeah, you're using my template with uh, Inet, right? Mm hmm Okay. Yeah. And I did initially build my own networking framework for it, like just using a WinSock, um, yeah. which left a lot of issues and I decided that I understood it well enough that I was happy with using Enet. Um, the goal of the game eventually is that everybody who is connected will get thrown into an arena with some pre-made maps that I'll make. Um, it is a shooter. It's kind of similar to your initial uh, multiplayer project that you showed off on your video, um, except it's round-based. So rounds should be quick is the goal. Players fight until they're the last one standing in like a battle royale free-for-all type thing. And then come the end of the round, players will pick upgrades to their player um, in reverse order. So if there's eight players playing, you'll get eight different upgrades put up, and you pick in order of whoever went out first to whoever mm -hmm. went out last. You lose lives based on when you go out. So it's like a, you have some lives, and you have it's last man standing with that, with the goal being that eventually you're just shooting differently, you're moving differently, that kind of thing, kind of building like a build. That's not, that's not a bad idea. Interesting. So for my networking, uh, I will show off the server first. I just kind of keep track of each client with all of their stats. And then this is kind of what I'm working on next is going to be the individual bullets and their bullet stats. But um, this is my ENET handling. All I am doing is I'm handling packets. And so whenever the player has an update, to their stats, to their movement, to whatever. I'm sending a, um, the goal is to eventually send um, an update packet just with all of the player's stats at the moment. And then I do something different based on the header of the packet that I send. All of my packets kind of follow this theme where it's a header, which is just an integer, which I'm keeping in an enum to keep track of. And then uh, values separated by semicolons. So I can kind of pull out information from the data. Um, the syncing is every 500 server frames. I just send out, or I guess it's just, I guess it's a configurable number, but every, like, five, every time this timer goes down, um, I send out, where is it? There we go. Uh, I send out an update on every player to every player, just to make sure everything is kind of keeping in, in step. So if there's any kind of fragmented data or anything like that, the client and server stay in lockstep together. Um, yeah, funny enough. So I just have so helper are, function. Uh, I, I see you are sending uh, stuff uh, using strings. Yes. Yeah, OK, that's not, you know, it's not that good, but it's OK. Um, okay. Yeah, we will we'll have to talk about like uh, code structure in general and networking stuff. Like there will be like two two different things. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we will we'll get to everything. 
Um, you can continue if you have anything else to. Okay. Yeah, it's just it's string based, and this is all stuff that I'm sure you'll kind of read over when when you start looking into the code here in the repo. But I mean, I'm just I just have functions to turn clients into packets and packets into clients. Okay. I was initially doing all these like individual ones, and I was just adding exponentially more work. So for now, my solution is just to handle it like this, just using everything at once. Um, on the client side, my game loop and everything is kind of split up just into a vague entity component system. I have my main game layer, and then I have some entities being the players and the bullets, which have their own functions that just act on them. Um, I have some functions to turn them into multiplayer data, but kind of unused for now, but they just store their stats. And then in the game layer, I have vectors to store all of the uh, player data here. So I have all of my bullets that are on the screen at the moment, and then uh, players from the network, and then this is the local player. Other than that, I'm kind of just using your 2D uh, rendering library to load textures and just render squares for now. So where, oh, you have two, two different projects, I see. Yes, one is just for the client side, one for the server side. The goal is that I can hand out the server executable to my friends that are going to play it with me, and they can host yeah, the server when they want. I would recommend, however, to, I mean, it's optional, um, to have them in the same CMake. So they are, like you have, can have two projects with, in, within the same CMake. So the advantage is that you don't have to open to Visual Studio instances and that you can is more easily share code. I suppose you have shared code between uh, this, the client and server, right? Um, not really, no, very little. You sh and, and how do you share it? Like you share the file or do you just copy it? I mean, none of it is really, none of it really carries over to the other one except for like some helper functions, like converting a client to a packet and converting a packet. Yeah, to a like you should, uh, you should kind of share a lot of stuff between the client and the server. That's another reason for why you should uh, have it in the same uh, CMake structure. Um, like for example, the player representation, like uh, when you'll get to like uh, a better uh, simulation, you'll have to maybe validate the things on the server. You know what I mean? Like shoots and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you'll have to have the entire gameplay simulation post on the server on every client. And I think you, you know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. So that code will be entirely shared between the client and the server. Okay. And you can imagine that it has a ton of dependencies. Like it's the entire simulation. It will have, have it will know about every object, every player. You know, it won't know about the rendering engine and stuff like that. But still, a lot of a lot of stuff to share. Uh, so okay. yeah, that is one thing. Um, okay, so this is just my estimate, right? Okay. Yeah, I think I made like one or two very small changes, but nothing that would be unfamiliar. Okay, so let's start then uh, renting. Oh, uh, I mean, yeah, you think. So you have a single file for this server? At the moment, yes. Yeah, I mean, you know, oh, okay, it's very small though. Hmm. Yeah, it's not it's not ginormous yet. I don't have any game logic in yet. It's literally just yeah. the position syncing. So well, I think you don't know, bro. So yeah, you'll have to split it into a few multiple files. Um, like you know, you, things like this, like bullets uh, and client stuff. Like, isn't bullet also a struct in the player realm in the client realm? Uh, yeah, on the client side, I'm treating it as an object. On the server side, I'm treating it as a struct. What's, what, wait, what do you mean object? What's the difference? Uh, or a class, I'm sorry. I'm using a class on the uh, on the client side. Yeah. Um, I honestly don't know how, they, how different they are. I'm trying to just keep the... No, it's just the, the, it's just the same thing. It's the same thing. Okay. The, the thing is that you're... Like, it's not very maintainable to have a code duplicate like that. Like, you... Maybe you would want to do like it's not impossible to not want to have uh, two different uh, implementations on like one on the server and one on the client. Maybe to optimize, but ideally you kind of want to avoid that if you can. Like even if you have um, different stuff between the, I mean, in the client will probably also have some extra data, you know. But like just uh, have some, I don't know, let's say um, struct uh, net. Bullet network. This is what I have in my Minecraft clone, for example. Anyway, it's uh, still work in progress. 
but it would be something like you know position and then you would have uh, maybe struct bullet I like to have uh, things named very verbose so it's very clear because yeah once once the code will will you know grow it will be it will be even better if uh, things are uh, named very clearly so this is the shared part so uh, and then you know you'd have like uh, I don't know sprite or something I don't know you name it and then you also maybe have a bullet uh, server that will also have like this stuff and then maybe timeout logic stuff thingy you know yeah I, I think you get the idea so why would you have three different structs for bullets why wouldn't why would you not just use one that holds all the stats so the idea that is that you you kind of want to have behave them to behave a little different like in the sense that um like you don't need to render the bullet on the server right so you might this is a, it's not a good example but you you'll have probably some extra information on the client that's not uh, like i don't know maybe some particular system you know what i mean some relation to another system visually maybe an audio generator i don't know like that thing won't be needed on the server also on the server you might have some extra data about like uh, i don't know you might have some timers that will um, whenever they trigger they will resend some syncing information you know okay S but you also okay, I think I see. yeah but you also want to have the shared data so you don't repeat yourself so you start with the shared data and then you add data if you need it so maybe you won't need these things you know maybe depends on how you on how you structure your stuff like i gave the example of uh, a sprite handler but you know it's not a good example because that thing should be separate from the struct itself like you want to store here uh, a texture for example well yeah, may yeah maybe if uh, every every bullet has a different texture you could do that that's true. Or like if you if you do more damage, the texture changes kind of thing. You would need to be able to do that. The server doesn't care about that, but the client does. Yeah, so you can exactly. separate that out exactly. so that you can have multiple structs. Uh, by the way, quick note. My textures in my library are just in, so you don't uh, don't be afraid to copy them. Okay. They are very, yeah, they are just an int, basically. Okay. Okay, okay. okay. So this was this thing. Also, now that uh, we are here, I also... Uh, I kind of don't like having initialized data, so I don't know, like, just as a personal thing, but I think many people also do this, I like to have everything initialized to some default data, you know, it's just easier to catch, uh, I mean, you know, it's, maybe it's not necessarily easier to catch bugs, because if it's uh, random data, it will crash more easily, but still, I kind of like to have things initialized like this, because it's easier for me to forget to initialize stuff. They are not initialized. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That's true. That yes. way everything is initialized. So when you come back to it, even if you just throw something up on the screen, you can see, oh, why is it with zero? Oh, right, because I initialized it, but I didn't actually do anything with it. So at least something shows that you know. Yeah, this is so you kind of get like the next steps. Mm -hmm. um, it's not perfect. Like maybe you want uh, you want the speed uh, benefit of not initializing it. Well, in truth, that speed uh, increase will be like extremely small to none. Like maybe, maybe that would happen only if you have like a, an extremely big struct, you know what I mean? So I would say just don't worry about uh, speed performance when talking about things like this. Just initialize your stuff, you know? Okay. I think it's just, it's just cleaner. And also, yeah, usually whenever I do, um, I have like an instance, I do something like bullet. And I also, I always, um, yeah, I do this out of habit. But anyway, you don't. If they are initialized here, you don't need to to do that. But I don't know. It just looks, um, let's say, clear. Looks clear. Clear. Yeah, yeah. It looks tidier. Okay. Anyway, so this was uh, this thing here. Uh, okay. Let's look some more. So you have some functions here that I like, like new connection, new connection packet handle. I also have something like this. Uh, it's. And I suppose, yeah, you just, uh, yeah, I like to also like to have the, the init um, function, like a little bit cleaner, you know, like easier, a little bit easier to read, like this. 
then I can just uh, you know call these things here. Let's see what you have mm -hmm. here, for example. Okay, so you have some uh, you have a vector of clients, I see. Yes, I do. That's how I store all of the the player data on the server side. Do you have uh, client IDs? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, they're just it's just an integers that you see on line two hundred two that current ID plus plus. Yeah, I also do that, and I suppose you store it here. Yes. Yeah, uh, I would store um, clients into a non ordered map rather than a vector. Because like most, most, maybe all of the time, you'll actually access clients by ID. So like if okay. I shoot an enemy, I just tell to the server, hey, I shoot that enemy with ID X, or let's say the server is the one to validate that. Um, it will just tell me, hey, you shot the player with ID, whatever, you know? So then you don't have to iterate with the whole vector to... But, yeah, it's, it, it doesn't really matter if there are a few, few clients. But this yeah, is... I think the max that I'm going to be having in each game is eight. But then yeah. even then, if I know what my max is going to be, then why not just use an unordered map? I think that makes more sense. Yeah, it's okay. Um, to also have the memory contiguous. But, yeah, you know... Just one thing to keep in mind. Yeah, you can leave it like this for now. It's okay. Okay, let's see. Uh, what is this? Uh, that is to turn a um, a client into a, um, oh, okay. a packet that's ready to send. So I, I, the thing I like about this is that it's very easy to... More or less, it's very... Hmm, wait. So, like, do you like tokenized stuff? Or do you like expect them to be in this order? Uh, yeah, I just expect them to be in okay, that order every time. So it's good that you have this, so like you can prototype more easily. But in general, you should uh, try to make a more optimized packet type. Um, I want to see how you structure your packets. So like, let's return. So while I'm here, this is the payload, okay. I want to see how the send message works. So, this is the data, which is this payload. Um, I'm curious, did you, where did you pull this number from? Um, doing research on UDP, I found that anything over 548, I think it was 548 bytes, um, means it's more likely to be fragmented on the router or on the, on the network side. So your data comes in fragmented and you'll get Issues with incomplete mm, data. Okay. Uh, okay, didn't know that. Interesting. Um, in it, to be fair, we handle these things. I okay. think. Well, at least on you know on uh, reliable packets. On unreliable packets, I don't. I think it will handle. No, like like you you can get a corrupt packet. Like it will just uh, you you won't get it if it's corrupted. You know. Uh, but interesting. Yeah. You don't want to allow this to happen. So okay. Good stuff here. Um, yeah, so what what I would do here, yeah, I you know I said that we'll talk about code first and then in it, but you know. Um, so what I did here and what I also recommend you to do is to have a, let's say something like this, struct packet. So you'd have something like a data. Um, that would be like a sharp pointer. Um, you'll see in a second why I did uh, this weird thing here. And then we'll also have um, type. This is the packet type, okay? Mm -hmm. So then, and then in uh, the networking header, I do have all of the packet headers in an yeah, enum. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So you'll have an enum for this type. And then, uh, you know, you have different types of packet. Like, I do a pattern, something like, you know, I have the enum here, which is like, uh, you know, packet connect. Okay, this is equal to one. I always leave my um, zero to like invalid. Mm -hmm. So you can have initial initialized data. So like if you forget to send a packet, you'll get a, you know, an assert maybe. Okay, and then I have a struct, um, which is, um, the struct that is has this comes with this uh, this packet, so struct uh, connect. I don't know why not, and you know you'll have some data here, whatever. 
and then this will be shared between the client and the server, right? Like all of this. Mm -hmm. So then, whenever you send a packet, you'll specify, you'll give uh, to this function the data, uh, you know, the size and the type, and uh, this function can construct your packet, so it will have to allocate some new memory. Um, by the way, if you want to optimize, you can you can do that with init. You can like create the because like after you create your memory, init will also have to allocate memory when you have to send the data. So you can just tell init to directly create the packet and then copy the data inside. Um, it's something if we take a look here after you say packet create, you can just um, go into packet data. Yeah. You can just mem copy your data here directly. Okay. If you if you don't uh, if you can pass it uh, here, you know what I mean. Okay, okay. So the idea with this is that you create yourself a packet. It will have this structure. So it will be something like uh, int stuff. Okay, so this is the ID, and then you have data. It will go for uh, you know size data. Okay, and the idea is that once you get your packet back. On the you know the other the other side, packet P. Uh, the idea is to be able to access the data from here. So uh, you can I think it will be, um, it will be better like this. Void pointer yeah it's good, and then you'll have uh, you know a receive packet and you can just uh, set the packet type to whatever it is and the. The, the data you have to send a pointer. Um, let me actually show you how I did it. Here. Powercraft, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is it packet? Please, please. Okay, let's go. Okay, so I did the, I use the function, okay. So I will just use the function, and uh, so if you read this function, I basically have uh, the header, the ID, and also I send the client ID. Um, I wouldn't recommend this because like, I don't use this half of the time, so it's kind of wasteful. It's kinda, yeah. So, you know, whatever you choose. But then the idea is that I have this function called the getData, and if you take a look at this code, you basically See that I go here with my pointer, okay, and then I increase it by one, so I go immediately after this. So if you imagine this is my packet in memory, I go immediately after the packet, then return that pointer. And that is because when I construct the, the packet, I merged my packet data with the actual data, you know? So this function will return me the pointer from here, right? Okay. Yeah. Did it make sense? So this would be for the most part. Yeah. Gets data. So again, I have my packet. It only has the type, this struct, okay. But then when I go ahead and create uh, the the message, the message will have the packet and the data merged together in one chunk of memory, right? So then to access the data, you know, I'll get my packet. It will be a chunk of memory. The first byte will be, you know, the first byte will be the destruct. And then I can just call the this the get data to get me the, the next the next part. And so what do I do with that? I have to cast it into the appropriate struct. Because again each you know each um, ID will have uh, an associated uh, packet. That you know you have to do a switch and then cast it into the, the appropriate data. You get you got the idea. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, kind of doing what I do, but instead of. Yeah, because. <laughs> Sorry, it's still simmering. It's. Well, the difference is that I have the, the packet type here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then you can just kind of figure out what packet type it is, and then throw it into the correct constructor yeah. for it. And yeah, why I started this discussion? Um, you have to be careful to like not send too much data. <laughs> Like you really have to optimize the data data sending. Um, I don't know. Init seems to especially have like a maybe it's a bug. I don't know. If you send too much data, it kind of starts to 
get behind, you know what I mean? And then it crashes eventually. Like it's the data, it's too much data build up. Like it's too late on the packets. Like it's, they are coming, yeah. f for some reason, they are coming a little faster than they, it can handle them. And it will crash your program. So you have to be careful. Like that's why, like, yeah, you shouldn't like do this. Um, like it works for right now. That's the thing. Um, but whenever you uh, start uh, testing it, like in a real world scenario, like with between two computers, you will see that it will start lagging very, very badly, and then it will crash eventually. Okay. Yeah, I started. I started with that, like just sending. Um, as minimal data as possible through ENET, and I just found that with the way my current, like the way everything is laid out right now, I just couldn't kind of get my mind around what I'm sending when. I yeah, think no, if it's I'm, okay to start, yeah, like this, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think it, it, once I start to implement more more structs for packets and make like a whole separate a whole separate file just for handling uh, handling packets, then I think that's a lot more doable. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Like you don't have to send the name every time, you know. Yeah, why? Yeah. You know, or the lives, or whatever. I can just send the the movement or the position and the velocity, for example. Yeah, exactly. Okay, and then, oh yeah, this thing, uh, clam, scanzip.exe. So this uh, thing here allows you to simulate a networking, uh, real networking scenario in your computer. So like if I can start it and our sorry I have to just yes, tell it um, where to listen to. Um, for example, I have this uh, configured for our craft. So it's like UDP and uh, this port and uh, outbound and loopback means uh, like inside my computer. And then I can check. I want to have leg, uh, drop frames and whatever. So you, you okay. can test. Uh, you can, yeah, you can test. Different specs, you can test for a different network latency for different. Okay. Yeah, and the thing is that if you start doing this right now, it will, you, your program won't work anymore, you know? Yeah. And I got a shock first time. Like, it, it worked well on my computer, but when I started to test it with two PCs, separate PCs, it started lagging, and yeah. Yeah, I've had a friend um, build, build the project and try and connect. And with my previous version, where I just used Winsock, it actually worked like surprisingly well. They were able to move. There were like some ghost characters being left behind just from some weirdness, but um, for the most part, the connection actually worked. Now that I switched to Enet, it does not <laughs> work nearly as yeah, well. Yeah, no, you, you kind of, we see I, that you kind of have to really optimize it. Yeah, Maybe they are not, sure. uh, it's not very well made, but you, you totally can, can achieve it in the end, you know? Um, mm -hmm. Also, one good thing with this, uh, this thing, the send message, you can later add some compression if you need to, algorithm, like you can just make a wrapper over it. Like uh, I used the, the library from Facebook, it's called, uh, what was it called, uh, libz std, it's a compression library. So let's see, look I have a flag uh, here that says if the packet is compressed or not, and uh, if it is compressed I just... Uh, you know, call the the compression stuff. Okay. Which, uh, lib st lib uh, yeah. It's lib z uh, std is kind of what is this called again? Sorry. Lib as std yeah. It's kind of it's kind of well written. It's kind of easy to use. Yeah. So it, if it is compressed, you know, compressed data, which is always good to compress. The less you're sending, the better, because it's it's CPU time. Uh, I don't think if I don't think it's worth it to always compress. Like if you have, if you don't have a lot of data, it won't really make the difference, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I don't. Know, I mean, even this, I don't know. But I, I I think that if you have like too few data, it will it won't have a good ratio of compression, so it won't be that useful. Okay. 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 Then you do this. This is okay. I mean, yeah, the, other than that, it's nothing uh, special here right now. Uh, yeah, these things will have to go eventually, yeah, you know, mm -hmm. one by one. And then, yeah, this is the the stuff that, uh, yeah, okay. 
Yeah, this same. is my biggest slowdown for sure, though. Ah, uh, not necessarily. I like it's not slow, but you know, it won't with dwarf work in later. Okay, you also. Let's also look at the client first, and then we can talk a little bit more about um, how you have to architecture some networking stuff. Okay. So yeah, you you got the idea that you have to to merge them into a single uh, solution. That's not uh, that's not really difficult. Uh, let's see solution explorer. Mm -hmm. I just haven't spent a whole lot of time with CMake, and since it's been working, I'm just you know. Yeah, my foundation wow. down, which I think I have. I think I have my foundation now to the point where I'm ready to start either expanding it or actually adding on to it. So if you have, take a look here, this is the project. Uh, these things have to be set up up, up only once. Mm. Okay, so we'll have two projects. Um, then this thing will uh, be different for each project. Maybe you'll also have some files, uh, like you'll have, uh, this is the, my sources. Um, you know what it is. This is uh, like defined to be all of the CVP files of your project, right? Yeah. So you'd have this one for uh, the server, you'll have this one for the, you know, client. And it will uh, just point okay. to a different folder. And then you have this one for shared stuff, because you'll also have shared. Oh, I see. Shared stuff, yeah. And it will have like, let's see, say, uh, I don't know, maybe like this, shared, and then this will be like client, you know? I see. And wait, okay. I'm trying to do that, okay. And then, once you have all of these um, things, you'll uh, put, add them here. So this is the, well, this will be the, <coughs> this one. So multi squares and then you have my sources and also my uh, shared sources you know what I mean okay and then so the this target one... source is, is how you set up um, what is using what and then you tell the this target you, sources what yeah this is how you set up the ACPP files mm -hmm. so you'll have this one and this one for uh, I don't know clients and then also be my sources client and also my sources shared For both of them, both will have one message shared here. It's shared. Okay. Okay. So nothing, Makes uh, sense. nothing difficult. And then this thing, this thing you'll have to do for both uh, both the uh, targets, the both projects. Uh, this CMake project name. This is just a you know macro for this. So you know you have to replace it with. Uh, the right project name because you have two projects. Also, yeah, set the right input directories. So you know the the include for the shared stuff and the include for the uh, client and server. And then link the libraries. Okay. So like after this line, you'll start uh, adding my your second uh, your second project, for example, here with this first client, and start uh, you know adding stuff. So it won't be difficult. Okay, let's take a look at. Uh, so I suppose uh, you haven't uh, modified anything here. Okay, so here we have some more stuff. So this is the code of the gameplay, right? Yeah. I. Yeah, so I would recommend because it, it will get cluttered. Um, I like the theories and regions. I also uh, like those. Uh, but I, I think it's better if you move uh, the game logic in another file and you keep this only for the main menu logic, you know? Okay, so keep, game, uh, keep the main menu here in this area yeah. and then move everything else. Because then you have to do this stuff, which I also, yeah, I also do this for my... my my Steam game, by the way, but don't tell anybody. Um, but it's, it's a mess, you know what I mean. So then you'd have this thing here, but then uh, if not main menu, yeah, if else, you'd have, you know, this stuff, but it will be in another function. So it will be way easier for you to, yeah. Okay, so init stuff, uh, okay. So here you're just using the UI library, right? 
Nothing. Uh, mm -hmm. Nothing fancy. Okay. Um, and then I don't remember know if you remember, like I was asking about text input and things like that. I had no. to do some funny stuff here because using your text input, um, oh yeah, had you wanted all the options. option to yeah to to specify which one to use. Yeah, so you can see my solution was to have three different buttons that change the mm -hmm. like a selected integer, and then I would just um, do some string manipulation based on the on the text input. I'll uh, I have to update it sometime. I don't have time right now, but I'll just update it so that um, what is the text input? Wait. What is? Isn't it? No, there's no text input. All I'm doing is reading the um, platform. Oh, input. oh, okay, okay, I see, okay, okay. Yeah, because if I did the text, if I did the text input, it would type into all of them. So, like, yeah. if I had all three text boxes on the same screen, if I press the number one, for example, it would type three ones into all three inputs. Yeah, I don't know. No, I just, I just update it sometime later in like I don't know, maybe five years. I just add a flag to the text input if it's toggled or not. Okay. Yeah, I think that would be nice. Okay, and then nothing special. Um, I kind of like how I did the API, like uh, the movie stuff. Not gonna lie, I like it. Yeah. I like my stuff. Nice. Yeah, good stuff. Okay. Um, yeah, again, I do like. I have a special function for these things here. Um, you know, I also do. Stuff like this, but um, I would have kind of have tried to have them them more organized. So, like for example, I also have this uh, something like this in my Minecraft clone, but I have it in a special file, and like I can't touch it directly. So, like uh, it has to go through a function, like connect, and it will set it there locally. You know, so it's not like a global variable. Like it is global, but you don't you I don't have access to it, like in the sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I just call a function connect stuff, and it will, it will be its job to set this thing to true or false or whatever. Um, okay. Yeah, and then you have to do this standard stuff connection. I suppose you have a handshake or something here. Yeah, I do a handshake just to get the ID and uh, starting position. Okay. And then uh, yeah, so about the input and stuff. So how you are supposed to do? I think. Wait, let me. First, uh, take a look if there is anything else here. And then, yeah, this thing, uh, I also have it um, on another uh, function, maybe, why not? And then you have rendering. Um, I wouldn't necessarily do network. I think I think it's better to do the network to the first thing in the frame. I think it just makes more sense because you get updates. You know, and then you respond to those updates, right? Okay. Like you are you are updating your your world, then you are getting updates, then you are rendering your stuff. You know, it doesn't really make sense, but it's okay. Um, not big deal. Yeah, that's an easy um, change. We'll have to talk about these things here, um, but uh, later a little, and then you do the rendering. Okay, good. So how you are supposed to do networking you should handle every every player like the same way locally so you have to somehow treat them equally even though you have a player you know so pro i mean i mean you can do it however you want um you can have the your player in this vector for example or you can just use you know functions and then call your those functions on you know all these players and your player, but the idea is that you have the exact same things applied to each player. So this will also and very importantly apply to the input, because in this way you can also simulate how the other players are moving, while you are also waiting for their uh, updates. So let's take a look uh, here. Wait, it okay? So this is your input, right? So this uh, uh, this yeah. thing. Yeah, this thing here updates the velocity and stuff. Okay. Um, so the velocity will okay. It's, it's also a part of the player, but it will. It should also go on the server. Does it go on the server? 
Yes, it does. Okay, and then you also have to update it for each um, for each thing for each player individually in the same way. You know what I mean? Oh, true. Yeah, I'm not doing that yet. You're not okay. So the idea is that I have, have that. Yeah, I have that. I just haven't done that yeah. yet, and I kind of forgot to do that yet. Okay, okay. So you have to you have to do that. So in this way, you are also simulating some player movement while you are also waiting for their updates. You know, this will make yeah. the movement. Yeah, of course, much smoother. Um, you also have to keep in mind that um, you can do like that forever. Like, let's say your uh, player has a you know high ping and it takes like forever to get some update from him. You don't want the simulation to like start going off screen to the right just because he happened to be pressing the right button at that time, right? Mm -hmm. You want that to be stopped. So, you know, maybe you have to... I haven't uh, done this yet in my things, but you know, you can put a timer and like if the, you don't receive an uh, update from something uh, after that timer, you can just clear its input and wait for the new update. Right? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Um, you also have to synchronize the timings and we'll talk about that last, I think. But first, um, let's talk about this. So, um, if I remember that there was something about this timer here. Let me take a look for a second how I did it. So I give you the correct uh, information. Okay, so in the server, so um, I you will you have that time I suppose for your client, right? I have like what sorry? Delta time, I suppose. Yeah, you are using delta time and stuff. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. you also need that on the server because you know you, you at some point you also need the server to validate your stuff and movements, right? Yeah. Okay. So you will get into a problem uh, because the server is, um, is will basically run very fast. You know, it doesn't have to do much stuff. It will run at uh, too big of an FPS and that will break your delta time calculations. So you basically never want your loop to run like at, I don't know, let's say more than I don't know, 2000 frames per second. But even that is too much, you know what I mean? And if you, if you happen to try that, if you happen to, if you make a game, and if you let it run like 5,000 frames per second, at least from my experience, it breaks the delta time calculations, like completely. Because of yeah, uh, if floating... it's too fast, it's too slow. Yeah. yeah, because of floating point precision errors. So then in the mm -hmm. server, you'd want to actually wait here uh, for like... Uh, for Yeah, here, this parameter. You'd want to wait like a little on the server, you know? Maybe maybe calculate how much to wait or something. I don't remember how I do it. Um, I think I... I think I see what you're saying though, where you, you wait on the server to kind of slow it down a little bit. Since, yeah. the, since the client has to do so much, the server can get ahead of them and really mess up delta time. Uh, no, it's not about um, getting ahead of them, but like both of them don't have to not run at like too, uh, too big FPS. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. Like the client like, also can, situation. yeah. The client also can run at more than sixty FPS and like I don't know, like two thousand. It will break the simulation. Um, that's why if you look at my code, I actually claim the delta time. Like the app will sleep if it will go too fast. I don't remember. It's like claim to like two hundred FPS or something. But like this will never go faster than that. Okay. But the server also have to write that yourself. So you have to add someone some sleep, or maybe, you know, just add it here. Probably this is the safest place in the server. Because if you are waiting, you might as well wait for some packets. Right? Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, make, wait to see, like, do we get any packets instead of just skipping right past it. Yeah. Yeah. So we can do... Because Enet will hold on to them in, like, a packet, like a queue, right? Like, and then process yeah. them kind of in order? Yeah. Okay. So, so you can do something like this the server, though you have a, there is a problem with this code in the server. Can you tell me what it is? There is a small, there is a subtle problem that could potentially happen. Um, if you get too many stacked up at once, it could slow it down. So let's say this is the, 
you know, you get the packets and then you do some more, more updates. You know, more updates here and then this is the main line, okay? This is the structure of the server, right? Mm -hmm. So we get here, we wait for like, I don't know, a few milliseconds and then we get a packet. So this returns true. And then we run this while, okay? Then we return back, but then we wait again another one second. And then we get another packet. Then this runs again. And then we get back here. And then, guess what? We also get a new packet in the next second. So the server never gets back here. Does yeah, so it just, it's just as long as it's receiving packets, it's never actually doing the game yeah. updates. Which is not okay. You have to also add a, a hard limit here, like it's packets plus plus less than 50, let's say. Like that, that's okay. Well, maybe not because uh, one second is too much. So you do something like, like this maybe? Or, well, ideally you have to calculate exactly how much milliseconds you can wait. Um, based on your yeah. plan at the time, but you'll have to mess around with that. Yeah, it's you know. Yeah, but it's just fun. if if you have like a hundred packets all can or a hundred clients all connected, and then you're waiting a full second, then you're getting too many packets for Enet to handle yeah. all at once, and then you're just locked in that networking handling. And so if there's game logic that needs to happen in the server, it never happens because it's locked in that. Yeah. Enet host service. Well, everybody tells it what it's okay. Well, that makes sense. Actually, in your code, not in this. Not the Enet will lock it, but your, uh, you know, stuff here. Whatever. Yeah, yeah. Do. Everything that's inside of there will keep running okay. rather than the game updates. Um, and the final thing that I had to talk about with you is uh, how you will uh, do the timing stuff synchronization. This is kind of fun, and also I'm doing it for the first time in my clone. Um, so, the idea is that you can have a fixed timestamp, fixed ticks, 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 sorry, and a variable timestamp, but the basic idea is that you have the, you know, starting point of application, okay, start mm -hmm. here, and then this is, you know, the run of your uh, game. You can imagine edge dot as a frame, okay, or maybe as a millisecond, okay? So let's imagine that each dot is one millisecond. So this would be a fixed timestamp um, mm -hmm. because you know you don't have uh, like less than one millisecond, and in one millisecond uh, you know it's how can I put it? Like more can happen between than one millisecond. But anyway, so the idea is that um, you can hold uh, this timestamp into a long, long unsigned long, long time. So you can imagine that it starts from zero, okay? And then each millisecond, you increment this timestamp, okay? So one, two, that, dot, okay? Makes sense, so... Uh, yeah, so start? keep track of how many milliseconds have passed. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, friend, competitive games also can use stuff like this. For example, Valorant uses fixed uh, ticks, but they have uh, like uh, 100 and... 28 ticks per second or something like that. So like the servers update really fast. We'll talk about later what's the difference between uh, fixed ticks and uh, yeah delta time. But 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 so once you do this, you can send uh, this timestamp to the server to tell him like hey at this time I'm here. And this is important because if the server knows that at that time I was there. He can more easily uh, correct my the movement of the player. Yeah, you don't you avoid jittering that way because if you say if the packets come in in order at timestamp thirty, thirty five, twenty, you don't end with your position on twenty. You can choose to end with it with the timestamp thirty five, um, and then end up in the correct position. Well, you actually get them in order. We see that. Okay. So you just oh, you get those many. Yeah. So you just one get, but you still get jitter. Because um, the time can be, be, be variable, you know? But if you get, let's say, the player says, hey, I'm here, I'm here at time, I don't know, 100, and it's like, uh, right now it's, it's, I don't know, 120, the server can take this 100, you know, say that, okay, 20 milliseconds have passed, and simulate your player movement using your velocity for 20 milliseconds. Okay? Oh. So you can run the... Uh, net the physics update 
with the delta time of 20 milliseconds. And then calculate the new position, and then add, send that to the next player. So like this is a player sending data to the server. The server will come here, update the data, okay, the position, let's say, and then send to the next player, but with this new timestamp updated, okay? And then again, uh, whenever a client will receive data, it will be something like, okay, it uh, got the um, player B is uh, there, it's time, okay? But it is, but it is uh, 130. So move him for 10 milliseconds. Make sense? I see. So instead of sending like their velocity, you just send position updates. No, and then you calculate. also send the, you also send velocity. You, you send both. Okay. But you need velocity to do the this update basically. Okay. But but you, maybe, because you can also calculate the velocity based on that, but then it may be different from the player. From player. The, the, the problem is that, like, um, the player told you where it was, okay, but then 30 milliseconds have moved, have uh, changed for that time timestamp, right? So you have mm -hmm. to take account from for that. So basically what I do is very simple. I just uh, have some, it's called like restant delta time. So like it will be something like 10 milliseconds. So this is just added into my normal physics update. You know, so it's, it's kind of simple. Well, more or less. You'll have to yeah, and I can see how that would, I can see how that would stop jitter because you then you can kind of figure out like, okay, they were here at this time, it's this time. So we can kind of figure out, even if we don't know how they moved, we can kind of figure out how they moved and using what yeah their velocity is and what changed, we can kind of figure out how to move them. I think I see. Okay. That kind of a prediction, right? Yeah, it will improve the... I've got, I've got three questions, yeah? Because I just started. So, f first one <clears throat> is, is there some good like math resources for the game developing? Is there some good math resources here? Uh, you can check uh, the resources. I don't remember something mm -hmm. specifically related to math. Because um, like there's a lot of math, and I I, I have to like build up my math log knowledge because my school didn't do very good job. So <laughs> uh, I think I linked. Uh, no, I link on my Discord on the resources. Let's take a look. Uh, if we go here, I think I have yeah I have this math. Sorry my, for my pronunciation. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, so there is some and, stuff, and also in graphics, mm -hmm. there is uh, some mass, mass uh, content stuff in this uh, series. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. The second question is, does like LWJGL count as low-level game development? Uh, what? The LWJGL, the... the that's, the Java, that's the Java library. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, but it's like a wrapper just around the native things for C++. Oh, yeah, so that's... Basically, yeah. Does it... It's what Minecraft uses. Does that count as low level? I mean, I you basically just a wrapper. I, I don't really like it, though. I mean... Uh, I, I, I use it once. Um, I don't really like it. Like... Because it, it is basically just a Java wrapper, nothing more, in that sense. It's kind of annoying to use. Like, um, so, you know, it's Java, you don't have... Uh, Memory allocation, pointers. like yeah, you don't have pointers. I mean, LWJGL you do, you do with, but whatever. But I, I, I was just curious, would that count as low level? Nah, not quite, no. Like, and and it's like counterproductive. Uh, let me just finish this point. So like it's, it's Java, you don't have pointers, but then you do some mm -hmm. weird stuff there to like allocate things on the stack and avoid the garbage collector. And it's just a mess, like you know, just in C++ mm -hmm. at that point. And the third thing is. Will there also be like a, a video or like covering maybe like client sided anti cheats, or is that like not a topic? Uh, we can talk a little bit about anti cheats, but I'm not advanced there yet. But basically, okay. for anti cheats, so we can continue with this topic. Uh, once you do yeah. time prediction, you can, uh, let's say, we 
I have the this uh, fixed uh, ticks variation, okay. So the basically the this is what Valorant does. So the server updates the physics 128 times times per uh, second, right? So these are the snapshots of the game, okay? And you know because there are so many, like 100, like it it won't be a problem for the for the players. Like everything that can happen, like shooting has to become inside one of those small windows, right? So then the player will tell him, hey, um, I updated my, I don't know, I shoot my bullet, but exactly this timestamp here, okay? And I mm -hmm. shoot it with that velocity and whatever. The server will basically have a window with the entire game state for each of these timestamps. And you have to implement that if you want uh, security, like validation of the from the server side, okay? So you have a small window, let's say record, I don't know, five seconds of, uh, you can easily record five seconds of uh, of gameplay, right? Uh, maybe have the entire physics state in a single struct, so it's easier to have copies of that, okay? And then your player will say, hey, I uh, shoot uh, a bullet here. Then you can easily look there and say, hey, okay, let's... Um, See if that bullet collided with something else. I don't know, let's say it travels to, through here in time. Then you can look here, okay, hey, where was the other player in this position? Was there any obstacle there, you know? And then the server will validate the the, the bullet shooting. I don't know, I, I, did I explain this uh, well enough? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense, because you can kind of keep snapshots of where everybody and everything is, and then the server can kind of say at some point, like, hey, let's check that on that bullet. That guy says that it hit, or this guy's client says that it hit, so let's track over those states and see if that would actually hit and then confirm exactly. it or deny it. And using snapshots is kind of easy to do. Um, the problem is that, you know, what happens if you shoot in between two snapshots? So like, for example, the CSGO, the new implement, the new game, they don't use uh, snapshots, they use like delta time. So like they have to, you know, uh, maybe roll, I don't know how they do it, but they probably roll back the physics in relation to exactly that timestamp. Yeah, okay, you know what I mean? Um, again, Valorant, which is well made, as far as I know, um, still uses this uh, tick system, but because they update the game very frequently, it's very okay. Um, so, two more things, about, I mean one more thing about how to synchronize this thing. So first of all, um, what would happen, question for you, what would happen when this thing will um, eventually overflow? Uh, it would crash, I mean if it overflows past the long long. Well it will pro, I mean it won't crash. Um, overflows on, on signs are actually defined. So it will return to zero. Yeah. But I mean, on the perspective of the app, gen, like the, you know, the simulation, the correctness of the program. I'm not sure what would happen, to be honest. Well, it will probably break, right? Yeah. Well, so yeah. something would go wrong. I'm not sure what would, but yeah, something would go wrong if it overflowed. So, trick question for you. How to how do you fix that? Or maybe trick question for everyone listening. Uh, do you just? I mean, my, my gut reaction would be to just check to see how close it is to overflowing um, or keep a second time stamp or something or just have uh, compare it to what the max would be. You could do that, but so um, you know how long is a uh, long long? No. It's uh, 8 uh, bytes. So this is 64 uh, bits, so this is... Uh, okay, so... Uh, 2 to the power of uh, 64. So you have to overflow this number. That's a large number. This large number. So if you take, let's say you, uh, so this will be incremented every millisecond, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say this time, this means 1000 times a second. So you take this number and you divide it by 1000. So you need this many seconds for it to overflow. If we divide it by 60, we need this many minutes, divided by 60, this many hours, divided by 24, this many days, divided by 360, oh, okay. 
this many so years. The question is, we would all be dead before it was an issue. Exactly. <laughs> it will never happen. So this is why I like long rounds. So, uh, yeah, quite a lot of time for it overflow. <laughs> half a million years, okay. Okay, okay. That, that's all. Just half a million years? Yeah. Okay, now how to synchronize this? Um, basically, the server will send you every, I don't know, let's say, I did something like uh, every two milliseconds, it will send you a timestamp update. So you can just send it at the beginning. You also have to send it every few milliseconds. So everyone is synchronized and then just run um, increment on your own. You know, using a, you, I do something like a float counter. This is zero. If, sorry, count static. So counter uh, plus equals delta time, which is in seconds. So if counter uh, bigger than, uh, oh, I hope my mess is right. It's kind of right. So it's this. It's maybe it's probably not right, but you, you can you can check it when you know you you are not tired. Mm -hmm. uh, it will be something like uh, timestamp plus plus something like this. And then you see that I'm not resetting it to zero. I'm I'm subtracting this, so I don't lose precision. Yeah. Yeah. Something like this. Then you run this both on the server, the client, the server will update you. And if you do some, you know, they, they will still be desynchronized. So by the time they send you the update, the time has already passed. So like they send you, hey, it's, uh, the server says it's, hey, it's 20 milliseconds. And then you get the message and it's like, oh, okay, it's 20 milliseconds. But then the time has already passed. It's okay because that's, even though we are desynchronized, it's um, kind of simulating it as well on the client side, so it should be, it receives it at 20, and then by the time the server is at 25, it'll be exactly. like 20, 23, whatever exactly. it is. The delay will take, in a way, care of that. And and that's also another reason that you have to all, also resend it, so it will, like, in a way, resend the delay. And it, it, it works in the end, that's the, that's the thing. But you have to fiddle around with it. Okay, let me check my notes to see if I haven't missed anything. So... Um, yeah, so again, you need to test your stuff on a real network or use uh, that uh, program clumsy. And um, yeah, optimize the data sending, not send too much data. Like I did something like sending data only when I change the input. So I would send a data when I press the start moving, you know, and then when I list it, and then every few milliseconds, something like that. Or maybe you can just merge all of, all of the time in a single package packet. So you are not sending too many packets. Oh, by the way, after you do timestamp stuff, uh, you should ignore the packets that are very old. Okay. Yeah, that so, makes sense. Because if you've got a packet that says, hey, I'm from 30 and we're at like 120, it's like, that's not useful. Exactly. So keep track of that. Okay. Okay. Uh, I also told you to simulate every client locally in the same way. Also with your velocity and stuff. And yeah, this is, uh, this is about it. So uh, great stuff here. Yeah, I fantastic. would say that uh, you are not uh, stuck right now. Like you have a lot of stuff to add. You know, you can add maps, you can add uh, map editor, you can add, uh, you know, you, you have a lot of stuff to add. So uh, yeah, you know, that's the end goal. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure like my foundation moving up into that. It, I'm trying to avoid anything that would make adding new content difficult easier because the end goal is I'd really like to add a lot of upgrades to the character and make it really easy to synchronize the way like that mm -hmm. changes. Like what if I have an upgrade where all of a sudden the bullet is explosive? Well, now I need to handle that on both sides. Yeah, so the, the, less, um... the less friction I have on adding things like that, the better. That was kind of why I wanted you to look over this. And I can see the I have a lot of it's not, uh, there's <laughs> not, um, I don't know of uh, an easy way of doing it like maybe the easiest way is to just uh, write the code of simulating the world only once which you can run both on the server on the client and you know then just send packets but you'll have to write a lot of stuff uh, from scratch for uh, every new mechanic but then you'll eventually be able to use stuff and it will be okay yeah that's kind of what i figure i just wanted to make sure my foundation was as good as possible so i run into less hurdles later on yeah, so yeah, i've yeah. been taking notes as well so i have a lot to work on now 
Yeah, you have to do some refactoring, but it's, it's pretty nice. I like oh, yeah. it. Very nice. Thank you. Thank I you very will, much. So be sure to give us updates on with photos on the Discord. I'm curious to see how it goes. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll keep you all updated. Very nice. I have a lot more to do on the network side. Which no is good. problem, man. I mean, you, you gave me a free video to make up. <laughs> No, that's <laughs> yeah. yeah, I expect Easy a five percent. Uh, <laughs> oh, when no. that Nord VPN sponsor comes in, no. <laughs> uh, All right. I, I, I don't I think. It. I mean, I, I don't. Okay, wait. I don't want to say stupid things, but um, maybe I will take a sponsorship from from Nord VPN. So if you are listening, maybe you know. <laughs> <laughs> No, I don't. That would be nice. Yeah, but but you can sponsor me if you want. I I, I don't mind. 